hello. <laughs> so grateful to, to see all of you, and I'm so grateful to be uh, back in Lake Havasu City. I was grateful to be here last year, and this is just wonderful to get to come again and to see some faces that, that I've seen previously and some new faces. I'm just really, really grateful for this opportunity. And today what I'd like to do is to share some ideas with you that have meant so much to me in my life. A while ago, I was searching on the internet and I was looking at some photographs that attracted my attention. They were of a home for sale. And it got my attention because the price was very good, I thought. And it was a historic home, but it had been very beautifully redecorated, brought up to date, new appliances, beautiful color scheme, all of the wood refinished. And I thought, oh, this is very nice. But then one of the photographs I saw didn't seem to fit with the rest of the photographs. Uh, this particular room they were showing me was really in a shambles. <laughs> that uh, The floorboards were actually warped <laughs> and the, the ceiling and the floor seemed a little bit too close together. So I, I looked down into the advertising copy to see what was happening. And in fact, that room was in this beautiful house. But there had been a, a little bit of a overzealousness, I guess you might say, with the previous owners. They decided they wanted the living room to be larger. And so they took out a wall. They just <laughs> took it out. Now you can do this, but you have to do it properly. You have to do it with lots of reinforcement and, and good engineering so that you keep your connection to the foundation. But they didn't do that. They just took the wall out. They hadn't noticed that that was actually an original outside wall of the house. So it was a serious wall they were taking out. And so they showed a picture of the outside of the house. And this beautiful house was literally like this on the one side because of that structural issue. And it, it got me to thinking about how sometimes we work to make change for the better and not much happens. <laughs> uh, you know, they made a lot of change with the beautiful house. But I realized that until someone comes along and does the serious engineering and the heavy work, no one's going to be able to live in that beautiful house because it is literally falling down. Thus, the price was right. <laughs> Not, not so right, after all. You know, a lot of times we go about making change for the better in a similar way. We go all in for the redecorating, for the surface level issues. And that can make a certain amount of change. We might get a new haircut, we might get a new wardrobe. Maybe we apply for a job we've been thinking about for a long time. Yeah, maybe we start running. There's nothing wrong with any of these things. They're, they're all good things to do. But if you want to make real substantive change, if you really want to build for health and harmony in your life and in our world, you need to get down to the structural issues, just like that house to make permanent long-term change that'll allow people to live in that house, they're gonna have to get down to the structural issues. And that's what we're gonna be doing together today. We're gonna be talking about four big ideas that help us get down to the structural issues in our lives and build up there from, from there for good health and lots of harmony in our world. The first big idea that I'm going to talk about is what kind of a foundation our lives are built on. And the second idea that I'll talk about is how our connection to this foundation can never be severed or shaken in any way. The third big idea that I'll talk about is the stuff that we're made of 
and why that matters. And the fourth big idea that I'll talk about is how we can prove the powerlessness of anything that would try to shake or harm us, or our world for that matter. Now while a building has a physical foundation, when we discover the foundation that is holding our lives up and the power of that foundation to uphold and manifest goodness in our lives, then we too have a solid foundation. So I'd like to share with you some parts of my life journey that helped me to find um, what kind of a foundation our lives are built on. My mother-in-law gave me a copy of this magazine, The Christian Science Sentinel, and I was just beginning to learn about Christian science, just really scratching the surface, so I, I was interested and curious, and um, I paged through the magazine, and I saw that the articles in the magazine were written by people just like us who had applied the ideas of Christian science to their lives. And as I paged, I found one article that caught my interest that I decided I was going to read. It was an article about, written by a woman who had been having problems with food, with her digestion. And she prayed about this, and she uh, wrote down the article to explain how she had been healed of these problems. Well, I thought that this was of interest to me because many years earlier, when I was 10 years old, my parents had taken me to the doctor because I had this repeating illness that they couldn't understand or what they should do to help me. And the doctor determined that I was allergic to chocolate. <coughs> and I wasn't happy about this, <laughs> needless to say. And it got a little bit worse when the doctor said the only solution for an allergy to chocolate at that time was don't eat chocolate. So on I went <laughs> into my life and uh, couldn't eat chocolate. I, it was hard for me to understand because I was the only one in the family that seemed to have this problem, but uh, I had no choice. So when I saw that article that day, I thought, well, chocolate is food. One of the major food groups, right? <laughs> For those chocolate lovers in the room. Um, and so I thought maybe I would find something in that article that could help me to overcome this allergy to chocolate. Well, the article was very interesting to me. The, the first thing that was interesting was it wasn't talking about food at all. <laughs> and I thought that was rather curious. But what it was telling me really caught my interest, and it was telling me about the nature of God in a way that I had never heard God explained before. I had a little bit of knowledge of the Bible at this time, but um, not a tremendous amount. And um, my understanding of God at that time was kind of like God was a big man in the sky, and uh, maybe you'll get a favor sometime, and <laughs> maybe you won't sort of thing. <laughs> but what this article was telling me, that there was a biblical basis for knowing that the nature of God is all good, only good under all circumstances, for everyone, everywhere, always. Well, that was new to me. And as I thought about it, I thought, you know, that's pretty good. <laughs> I, I felt uh, my sense of security becoming strong almost immediately with this idea that God was all good and that God was the only power. So then all of the power that exists anywhere is the power of God and it is good. And this really just reached way deep down in, in my thinking. And 
um, started to give me a good, solid foundation. Eventually, the article got around to food, and it said that an all-good creator, the God that I had been introduced to, would not create within its wonderful creation anything that would conflict with anything else. That was what the writer had concluded in her life, that, that food could not conflict with her because both the food and the woman were part of God's creation. And she had her healing on that basis. She changed her thought about food. She, she let go of all of the thoughts that would have been pointing to this food or that food could cause her a problem. Well, this logic appealed to me. It really did, because I thought that it made sense that you know God wouldn't create conflicts within the creation when God is only good. Well, it doesn't take too long to read those Sentinel articles. It probably took me about three or four minutes. But I had already started to change my perspective. A very interesting thing happened later the same day. Someone offered me a little box of chocolate. And it was, it was very sweet little box. It had four pieces of chocolate in it that were in the shape of shells. Very, very interesting. And instead of doing what I would have done previous to reading that article, which would have been, I, I would have said, oh, no, thank you. You keep it for yourself. I'm allergic to chocolate. But I looked at the chocolate, and I thought, you know, that article told me that there's no conflict between me and the chocolate. And I think I'll just try it. And so I did. That day I accepted that little box of chocolate, and then I ate it all, <laughs> very happily. <laughs> and the, the real wonderful thing was, after I finished eating the box of chocolate and time went by, there was no allergic reaction. And this, of course, was a fun change in my life. But there was so much deeper than that that had gone on with my reading that article. Because I realized that it was telling me there's a biblical basis that the source of my being and all of our being, that we come from God, that God has created us. We come from a good source. And coming from a good source means that our existence is built on a solid foundation. And so the, these ideas really made other changes in my life beyond the chocolate, which I continue to enjoy. Uh, it made me feel much more hopeful, much more confident in everything that I was doing. And it even made me feel physically stronger after a period of time of thinking in this new way. I'd like to share a few more ideas. Now, I will be talking about the Bible today, but you don't have to be a Bible scholar or, or even having had a previous interest in the Bible. But there's so many um, good examples of lives that have been changed for the better in the Bible. I will be touching base with it. But I want to start out right here at the opening verse of the Bible, which you may be familiar with. Uh, it says, in the beginning, God created the heaven and earth. And it goes on for a couple of pages to talk about what the nature of God's creation is. And it talks about how good it is and all the goodness in it. It talks about having made men and women and that they were made in the image and likeness of God and that everything that he made was good. Well, what caught my attention about that short passage was the word beginning. 
Um, up until that time, I would have thought that the word beginning meant that a point in time, you know, a specific point in time, a year <laughs> that we might find. And I thought, oh, well, that would be interesting when we found out when this all began. <laughs> and I wondered, will we ever find out when this all began? But then I realized that the word beginning also has other meanings. It also means at the source, at the foundation. And in the Latin and Spanish translations of the Bible, the word beginning is translated as principio, which means the principle of a thing, which means a source or the foundation or the basis that things proceed from. Thinking about this, my concept of what God is, my understanding of what God is, changed a little bit more. I was able to get away from that idea of God as a man-like creature. Right? And to think of God as a principle, the source of all things, the active principle behind all things that empowers and upholds goodness, only goodness. And this was very meaningful to me also, and it added to my conviction and my strength because it brought out that idea of that constancy, that reliability, that our foundation is reliable, that it's permanent, that it's indestructible. And, and all of these things contributed to my individual progress at that time. I was just beginning as a young person. I, I was starting to establish a career. And I had been having a very difficult time with that. And I started to understand that with the uh, next chapter in the Bible. And I'm not going to go chapter to chapter, so <laughs> I promise. But the next chapter talks about that Adam and Eve story that we're all fairly familiar with. Um, and if you take these two chapters together, you have this wonderful, perfect, all good creation. And then it seems like in the second chapter, everything starts to go haywire. If you look at them individually, you can think, what are there, two creations? What's going on here? But if you think of them together, the first one is telling you the reality, the pure truth of being. And the second one is telling you to look out, <laughs> to be careful, to not lose track of the fact that you are built on a good source. You come from a good source, you're built on a solid foundation. Because the second chapter shows how if we forget about that foundation and that source and its pure goodness, we may start thinking that we could be ill that there could be some uh, problem or destruction or, or uh, discordant relationships as everything that's laid out there in that chapter. So the two chapters together are really encouraging us to stick with that foundation, to remember where we come from, where we come from and where is the power. There's many uh, folks in the world that have this view that existence is a mixture of good things and bad things. It's a pretty typical view. So much so that you even hear it in the language. You know, we'll, we'll say things like good luck and bad luck. There's not just good luck and good luck. <laughs> it's good luck and bad luck. They talk about have and have nots, you know, people that succeed and people that don't. Uh, there are people who feel really good about life because they understand that they have good genes, their physical makeup. And then other people are very afraid in life because they understand that they have bad genes, so they have expectation that they might have problems. Well, this is 
a very different perspective than what I was learning in the Sentinel. And the ideas from the Sentinel are coming from the Bible and from this book, Science and Health with Key to the Scriptures by Mary Baker Eddy. Mary Baker Eddy discovered Christian science and I'll talk a little bit more about what that means as we go on today. But her book, in very practical terms, explains the relevance of the Bible to our lives today. And if we go back to that first chapter in the Bible that talks about God being all good and the creation being all good, then we may want to think about other possibilities of what our prayers are for. And I think everyone prays. You know, we all call out for goodness, for help, for love. It's just kind of a natural part of being. And many times we think of those prayers as being for the purpose of helping us through this existence that can seem pretty bumpy because it seems like this mixture of good things and bad things. But on this different basis, on the basis that Christian science presents, our prayers kind of can be a little different than that because Christian science stands for the goodness of God, the perfect, unfailing, ever-present goodness of God. So our prayers are really for the purpose of proving that goodness, proving that that goodness is intact, it is upheld by this infinite principle that never fails, and it's, it's powerfully upheld. It's an active principle upholding good in our lives, in our individual lives, and in the world. So we can pray acknowledging that power of God, being a witness to that power of God, and those prayers can overcome challenges uh, like the allergy to chocolate. They can overcome um, financial challenges. They can overcome health challenges. In fact, in, in the back of this book, Science and Health, there's 100 pages of accounts, verified accounts of people who have been completely healed of health issues, many of them very serious, um, just by reading the book. They didn't call on anyone to pray for them or to help them. They just read the book. And the book itself and the ideas that it presented brought healing into their lives. Well, I would like to share another healing experience that I had. And it was a kind of a tough situation. <laughs> It made me, for a time, believe in this idea that evil is real and mixed with good, which is, uh, of course, what I've been pointing to us, kind of moving away from that idea. Um, but we all learn along the way in our lives. I became very ill, and I was suffering from the symptoms that people would um, usually connect with pneumonia. And I really wasn't able to do much of anything. I was pretty weak and, and just spent most of my time in bed. And I was reading these two books, Science and Health and the Bible, and thinking about the implications of what it was telling me about the nature of God. In a sense, I was seeking to know God even better. And God is infinite, so we're always gonna be seeking to know God better. There's just always more of the goodness of God and of the love of God to become acquainted with. Well, before I became ill, I had a career derailment. And this career derailment was very destructive. I'd been working on a project for a long time that I was very excited about, something I really loved. And I thought it was my long-term career trajectory. 
And what happened was the other people that were working on this project told lies about me. I never really understood why they did this or what their purpose was, but the lies were very destructive and that put an end to that project. I was, you know, out, out of work. And because of the tales they told, I was feeling that in that case, evil must have won. Now, I wasn't thinking clearly <laughs> according to what I had learned about Christian science. Well, after about seven days, I was still feeling very rotten. I still had all of these symptoms. I was still really incapacitated. I was also getting a little bit more humble, maybe, <laughs> and just working to, to listen more to inspirations coming from God and the inspirations from the books that I was studying. And partway through the day, a very new idea came to me. And that idea was that even though unethical people had told lies about me that had put an end to my career, God, because of God's nature as the principle that upholds all goodness, had never stopped upholding goodness in my life. And that is that second big idea I told you about. The first one being that God is all good and all powerful. And the second big idea is that our connection to our foundation, to God, can never be severed or weakened in any way. And that was what was coming to me that day in a much more clear way than it ever had before. That even though I was in a bad situation, I witnessed people being uh, bad to me, and I had lost my form of employment, nonetheless, God, by God's very nature, had not stopped upholding and empowering its goodness in my life. And this thought really, you know, reached where that problem was. Because all of a sudden I realized, oh, it can't be possible then that evil won, has won. I thought evil hasn't won, I just don't know the end of the story yet. And I immediately felt physically better. That day in the evening I started cleaning up a little bit, I was up, I was moving around, and the next day I was free of all of the symptoms that had kept me down for the whole week. And I was free of, of believing in evil. And I was free of the fear related to this job disaster. I did not know what was going to happen. I didn't get a miraculous phone call the next day <laughs> telling me about some job. But I knew that something good would happen because I agreed with that thought that came to me that God would not ever and had not ever stopped taking care of me. And this is true for every one of us, no matter what our life situation may look like at a particular moment. God is there taking care of us, and we can depend on that to uphold the goodness in our lives and to bring more of it into focus. With the job situation, um, after a short time, I had a new position that became available and that, that I was given, and it was very good. It, it was a position that allowed me to expand the work that I loved, and it gave me lots of opportunities to meet new people, which was also a very delightful part of that job. And a lot of these new people that I met became very fast friends and brought very unique dimensions into my life that enriched my life.
considerably. So there was lots of good, and it makes sense, just like in the first uh, healing that I shared about the chocolate, I got clearer views of God and goodness. I got a better understanding of that, and then I had more good appearing in my life. I was seeing what is really there, but that was obscured because of my misunderstandings about the nature of God. That pure, perfect goodness and the life and the world that comes from that is already intact. It's already there. And our prayers being a witness to God's goodness and putting down the false belief of evil and badness of any kind help us to see more of that goodness, and then we see it in our lives and experience it. So I was physically healed, I had the employment replaced, and my life expanded in a very nice way with very interesting new friends. And the same comes to anyone <laughs> as we seek to know God better, seek to be a witness to that harmony of God Goodness, you know, is harmony. It's like a beautiful hymn or a beautiful piece of music. Everything is moving together just the way that it should be. And God's goodness upholds and inspires goodness and healing for our world. You know, we have, it seems like this is a time in, in human history where there's lots of discordant things. But the real creation that God has made, we can live together <laughs> in peace. Everyone, not just one group or another, everyone can live together in peace. Because God has made us in his image and likeness. He has made us to perceive those things that are really vital and significant, and to be filled with the good. I want to talk about the third big idea, which is the stuff we're made of and why that matters. Now that's a big question, isn't it? The stuff we're made of. To put that into a useful perspective, we really need to talk about Christ Jesus. And the ideas that I've been sharing from Christian science are very much based on the work and the life of Christ Jesus. When Mary Baker Eddy made her discovery, she prayed for a long time to uh, find out, well, what is this to be called? <laughs> and through her prayers, she came up with Christian science. Now the science part is what I've already been talking about. The part about, you know, what is our foundation? What is the principle that governs all things? And who are we? The image and likeness of that all good principle. The Christian part is based on the life of Christ Jesus that we read about in the Bible. And Christ Jesus, um, his life and his way of living always pointed to goodness, you know, elevating goodness and, and love. Christ Jesus lived love. He, his endeavor was always to heal, to uplift, whether it was moral issue or a physical issue, that was truly apparent in his way of living. The word Christ is often referred to as a title for Jesus, and it, and it points to the way in which he taught us that we connect with God, that Christ, the Christ element that always came out in his healings, our connection with God. And even though Jesus isn't here with us, the Christ is still here. And I've 
talked about it without using that name, so I'll <laughs> just go back and touch on that. When I, when I had that healing of the allergy and I read the Sentinel and I got these new ideas about God, that was the Christ coming to my consciousness. It was the love of God teaching me, pointing the way for me, for a better life, a healthier life, a, a more harmonious life. And that intuition that came to me in the second healing, that uh, God's love for me was consistent, even if humanly I was experiencing bad things. God had not left me high and dry. He had continued to maintain because he is a principle that is always in effect, not a person that might feel like it today and maybe not tomorrow, but a principle like, like the principle that's the basis of mathematics. You always get to the right answer following the principle because the principle doesn't change. And thinking of God as a principle, God doesn't change. God is always love, pure and perfect love, and God is always all good. Christ Jesus showed us this, and I have experienced this consistency of God's love, and we all have. We may not be able to put your finger on it, but I bet as you go home and leave the talk today, you'll start remembering things that happened in your life where really it was the Christ that came to you and a good idea, a true idea from God coming to your consciousness and lifting you out of a false concept of God and of existence. Christ Jesus gave us the Sermon on the Mount. And I become more and more impressed with that all the time. It, it kind of reminds me of when I first read that article and it wasn't saying anything about food. <laughs> and it was talking about God and then I was healed. <laughs> and Christ Jesus' Sermon on the Mount is telling us how to live. But it's not telling us about diet, exercise, food, all of the things that um, we often think of have to do with health. He was telling us about love. He was telling us about tenderness. You know, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Kindness, goodness. He said, take no thought for your life, what you shall eat or what you shall drink or for your body, what you shall put on. For the life is more than meat, and the body is more than clothes. He was pointing us to the direction of spiritual things, not flesh and bones, muscles, organ things. And he was healing people along the way in his life. He did many healing works. He was changing thought. You know, that, that's how these healings took place in my life. And I wanna share uh, very briefly the healing that Jesus did of a leper. Leprosy was very feared. There are still places where leprosy is a problem. Um, it was feared because it was contagious. And so in Jesus' day when people had leprosy, they would send them outside of the town. There was a leper camp, colony, and you'd have to go stay there until you were free of the leprosy. So essentially these people would have to go away from their families, their employment, they just have to leave it all behind. And this leprosy kind of put their life to a stop. Well, when this leper came to Jesus, Jesus did a very interesting thing, I, I've always felt. He touched the man. 
he touched him. Clearly, Jesus was not afraid of contagion. Clearly, he did not define this man as being someone that was going to harm him if he touched him. But I've thought about what did that touch mean to that man? You know, and, and was it a physical thing that was going on there? Or was it a spiritual thing? Here's someone, just put yourself in the place of this man with the leprosy. You're barred from the city. You're barred from your family. You're an outcast. And someone comes along and touches you. Uh, probably the first time anybody's touched you in a really long time since you had this problem of leprosy. And it would be such a freeing thing because you would feel that affection that was indicated in that gesture. You would feel the caring. You would feel cared for. And you would undoubtedly realize that this man who is touching me is not afraid of the leprosy. So you would likely be freed of your own fear of it. And that's what happened that day. The leper that came to Jesus was healed of the leprosy. He was completely freed of it. His life was certainly changed for the better. He could go back to his family. He could go back to his form of employment. His life was, in a sense, starting over again. The kindness of Jesus and Jesus' fearlessness had changed that man's thought, lifted him out of the fear and disappointment and discouragement of the situation that he had been in. And he was completely healed and freed. To build for health, we want to build for a different perspective, a, a different way of understanding our being. You know, the stuff we're made of is not what we think it is. When you think of how these healings took place that I've shared, it was change of thought change of thought, clearer thought of God, consciousness of one's worthiness. And that brought physical healing as well as emotional improvement, spiritual uplifting. We're made of what God has conceived of. The all good God that we read about in the first chapter of Genesis. What did God create? It was all good. And we are, by our creation, all good. Unchangeably good. And we find the healing when we're we're discovering that goodness. We're discovering what does it mean when the Bible says made in the image and likeness of God. God is spirit, the Bible tells us. We're made in the image and likeness of spirit. Though by all appearances, it seems like we're matter walking around. But we're made in the image and likeness of spirit. And, and that's why a change of thought can change our physical well-being. As our thought lets go of the material basis, the frightening things that we have heard and collected over our life about the body and what it would be, whether it's heredity, something we think that's inevitable for us because some other family member had it. Well, if we come from an all-good source, then it's not inevitable for us. And it wasn't inevitable for that family member either. We come from an all-good source. 
we're upheld by the power of God, by the power of spirit. That's the stuff we're made of. We're made of God's concept of us and how wonderful each and every one of you are. And for that matter, all the world when we walk out today. Made in the image and likeness of an all good, all loving God. And this is discoverable. Christ Jesus taught us about it. And Mary Baker Eddy discovered it. She searched for a long time. She didn't discover it until she was in her um, mid-40s. And she came from a religious family. They were Congregationalists. She loved her Bible. And she was always close to God in the sense of always thinking that God was a significant part of her life. And she was a very excellent Christian. She loved the Sermon on the Mount. And she lived her life with that as her map. That was her road map. She followed that um, all through her life, even as, as a young person. I remember she, a story where she was um, in the schoolyard. So she was probably about eighth grade. And one of the students was being bullied. And by some of the big boys, you know. But Mary, she stood up to those bullies. She did the Christian thing. She reached out to help. And she protected the person that was being bullied. And she was confirming her own Christianity. She was living what she had learned um, from her Christianity, from her study of the Bible, and from the church she had gone to at that time. This Christianity was so distinct in her life before she discovered Christian science, and more and more it makes sense that it was her Christianity, her love of her fellow man, that opened the way for her to discover Christian science, to discover these ideas. She uh, had suffered from ill health all of her years, but she didn't give up on, on God. And she w was involved in a serious accident at one point, and there was a doctor that came to attend the situation, and the doctor said that she wouldn't walk and that she may not survive. Well, Mary did what she often did in her life when she came up with challenges. She looked in her Bible. She just opened the Bible up that day when she was quiet and alone, and she opened it to one of Jesus' healings. And she read that healing work. And that particular day, I think with you know, her, her years of Christianity, her years of living love herself, something opened up to her as she read that. And she saw something she'd never seen before, though she'd read it many times. And she actually wrote about that, and I want to read it in her words because I, I couldn't uh, summarize them at all. She said, as I read the healing truth dawned upon my sense, and the result was that I rose, dressed myself, and ever after was in better health than I had before enjoined. She was on her feet walking. She says, that short experience included a glimpse of the great fact that I have since tried to make plain to others. Namely, life in and of spirit. This life being the sole reality of existence. She glimpsed life in and of spirit, spiritual existence, the basis of the healings that Christ Jesus 
did when he was here on earth. And she was physically healed. She was grateful to be physically healed, but she wanted to know more. She wanted to know, could this be repeated? You know, could I teach people how to do this? She felt it, this is something that the world needed. So she went to the Bible for her search of getting deeper understanding of what this experience was that she had that, that brought her into better health than she had ever been. And she found uh, rules in the Bible, looking with these fresh eyes at Jesus' healings and, and the entirety of the Bible. And she was finding things that helped her to understand what her experience was. And she started healing other people. She, during this period, while she was studying the Bible, she healed a man who had been deaf. He had totally lost his hearing, and she totally restored his hearing. His hearing was completely restored. And she healed a little boy who had never walked. And his ability to walk and run was completely restored. He was, I think, about eight years old or something like that. And so he was able to go back and run with all the other little boys. Well, more and more healings took place. And after a time, she realized that she could teach other people how to do this healing work beyond healing other people. And there's many uh, wonderful accounts of healings that took place in her biographies. She devoted the rest of her life to make what she had discovered available over the long term. So this is here we are 150 years later, and I'm able to be talking about it. And you can, you can read about it in, in her book, Science and Health, and you can read about it in the Sentinel magazine, which is still published. There's also the journal magazine. And she had a strong feeling that Christian science was not just for individual physical healing, but that it was for the whole world to bring harmony, unity to the whole world. And so one of the last things that she did was to start the Christian Science Monitor daily newspaper. And to, today it's daily online on the internet, and it's a weekly news magazine. And her inspiration to do that was to always be bringing out the goodness that is going on, always to be blessing everyone. And that paper goes on as a testament to that. It is, it is a news paper. <laughs> it's not a paper about Christian science. So it's called the Christian Science Monitor. There's one article in there every day that gives a Christian science perspective on things. It's probably often the shortest article, but it's a, a news, it's a newspaper to show the good that's going on, to show hope, resolution for the challenges that seem so difficult. She wanted the world to know that God is good <laughs> and what that means to all of us. And it was her Christianity that allowed her to make this discovery, living in a world very much like our world, which doesn't necessarily seem all that spiritual. But she found that spiritual nature of all of us through the life of Christ Jesus. I want to share one more thing, which will be the fourth big idea that I talked about. And it, it is an experience I had um, that really helped me to start to grapple with that idea that only good is real. We, we like to hear that, but it's hard to put that into perspective of our daily lives. Um, oftentimes, if you're telling someone about Christian science, they well, yes, this is wonderful. God is all good. This is wonderful. But, you know, what about the war in Ukraine? 
What about the violence in our city? You know, what about the homelessness that we see? So many, so many subjects that seem to contradict the idea that God is all good. So it's, it's an important thing to really r wrestle through. Uh, for, for me, I think it was kind of a wrestling sort of a thing. It's an important thing to get through because it really, again, helps us to see more clearly and perfectly the goodness of God and God's all power. And it also gives us a calm amid the storm. And it seems like there is a storm kind of always someplace. So in, in her book, Mary Baker Eddy tells us, God is not the creator of an evil mind. We must learn that evil is the awful deception and unreality of existence. So how do we do that? Well, we, we start with our own thinking. We look at our own thinking, and if we see an enemy there, or if one tries to creep in to our own thinking, um, we, we pray about it. We ask God to help us. We um, stand firm that goodness is the real, and God didn't create anyone to be our enemy. God created us to live together in peace. The life of Christ Jesus showed us, you know, to be at peace with one another, to love one another. These are all significant things that Jesus taught. And so we want to see, and we want to, you know, examine our thinking and see if we're holding any thoughts that would not come from love one another if we're holding any thoughts that, that would be condemning someone or negative or critical of someone. All of these kind of thoughts really dim our ability to perceive the perfect goodness of God and the perfect love of God. And that is so much what the world needs right now, to perceive more clearly the perfect love of God and our perfect unity, all people in perfect unity. Well, one night I had a situation that came up. Uh, it was very late at night, the family was all asleep and there was a big noise that rousted me out. And I thought, wow, what was this big noise? What's happening? And then I didn't hear any other noises. so. I stayed in bed, but I resolved I would pray because I was a little shaken, honestly. And the first prayer that came to me was about God's ever-presence, that God being ever-present, being a principle that's universal, is present everywhere. And that God was present in the room where I was, he was present in the room where each of the children were, he was present outside our home. He was present down the street. I was kind of in my mind seeing the little neighborhood there where we were and thinking about God being present there everywhere. And I also thought that God must be present wherever that noise was that I heard, that God even had to be there. Well, I started to gain my own peace and I didn't hear any more noises outside. But then the thought came to me, that I was afraid because I thought maybe that was a thief, that somebody was breaking into something. And I realized if I was thinking there was a thief, I was thinking that I had an enemy or an antagonist, or, or that God could have created a class of people and called them thieves. <laughs> you know, you're gonna be the good people, <laughs> you're gonna be the thieves. Uh, and I thought, well, that can't be right, because an all-good God wouldn't make anyone that he would intend for them to be a thief. That just can't proceed from the nature of an all-good, all-loving God. So I prayed to get that out of my own thought, and I was grateful to be corrected and to, 
to think right and to know that you know God was present in that whole neighborhood and was giving everyone in that neighborhood good thoughts, good ideas about what to do with their life. Well, it was pretty late at night, and I was thinking, okay, I've prayed. <laughs> I wanted to go to sleep. And I started to doze off, and another thought came to me, and it was very strong and demanding. And that thought was, how could those prayers do any good if someone already stole something? <laughs> oh, boy, I didn't know. <laughs> I didn't know, so I just thought, well, I'm going to be still, and I'm going to just listen. And such a beautiful thought came to me that day. The thought that came to me was that if someone had made a mistake and had stolen something, that God would still be guiding them to change their course and do right. And I love this <laughs> because of the situation with the noise, but also personally I loved it because I had been making a lot of mistakes <laughs> at that time in my life. And I, every time I made a mistake, it was a pretty big crisis to me. And I was feeling that when I made a mistake that I was on my own, you know. I made the mistake, and I was feeling I had no help to correct my mistake or to prevent future mistakes. Essentially, I was feeling like, you know, if you make a mistake, God's not going to help you because you did the wrong thing. And here, this, this inspiration that came was saying, here's someone who's breaking the law, right, a thief. And if they made a mistake, God would still be helping them. And I thought, oh my God, that's right. If I make a mistake, God is helping me. And this was huge to me. Um, very, very helpful. And I was very touched by love. By love as in God is love. I'm sure that says that in here. <laughs> uh, I was touched by this huge sense of love. I realized that even if I made mistakes, I wasn't separating myself from love. And I felt that love. I, I even felt it physically. I just felt real warmth come over me. And I thought about the potential thief. And I just thought, well, that's right. If there was a thief, God would be helping them correct their mistake guiding them to change their course and to go in a better direction. And I also felt the love of that. So enveloped in love, I actually fell asleep <laughs> at that point. And the next day, when I left my home, one of the neighbors was out on the sidewalk and she's running down the sidewalk and waving. She really had something to tell me about. So I waited and talked to her. And she said, did you hear what happened here last night? And I said, no, I, I don't know. And she said, she said, the garage next to my home was broken into. And she said, several items were taken. And I went back and remembered you know, my prayers in the night. And um, I said, oh dear, I'm so sorry to hear this. And she said, no, no, no. That's not the end of the story. I said, really? She said, no. Nope. She said, everything that was taken from the garage was found three houses away, laying on the front lawn of another house. Well, I just felt that love <laughs> just, just come back again in great, uh, huge, gushing warmth to me. Because I thought, oh my goodness, I'm praying really mostly for my own safety, you know, and, but somehow it appeared that the, that prayer of God continuing to guide us, even when we make a mistake, had reached out of the house and had an impact on this person, whoever it was that had taken those items. 
and had clearly had them change their direction. And I think it's something we all should ponder and appreciate because that means that every prayer every one of us has is doing a lot more than we think it is. It's doing a tremendous amount to establish harmony in our community and in our world. When we're reaching out to understand God better, to perceive the power of God to uphold and forward goodness in our world, that's going out. It's reaching out. It's kind of like when uh, you are in a dark room and it's sunny outside and one person goes over to open up the blinds and that lets the sunshine in, but it doesn't just come in on the person that opens the blinds. You know, it fills the whole room with light. And when we're praying, when we're acknowledging God's goodness and that only goodness has power, that reaches out beyond. And I would just add one thing, you know, one, one of the things about um, bad stuff is, is that it can look rather startling. It can uh, get your attention, you know, it can make you afraid. But when anyone or any group of people, you know, is doing something that is, that is bad, harmful, violent, they're not being motivated by God. There's nothing of God behind what they're doing. They're acting on ignorance and fear. And you can analyze that after you leave and see when you see something. Like, ignorance and fear, you'll find it. <laughs> There's ignorance and fear. There's nothing of God there. So even though these things can look very alarming, they are by their nature powerless because they have nothing of God. And God is all-powerful, as the Bible tells us. And as Jesus' healings proved, and as Christian science has been proving over the last 150 years, God has all power. Spirit has all power. And to have a solid basis for our health and for harmony in the world, remembering that key point that we are spiritual, we're not material. We proceed from God. God is the light of our being and God is spirit. And knowing this about everyone you meet is really daily improving the world. You're kind of shining a light you know, on the people that you meet, shining a light on their connection to God. Well, maybe you don't talk about God. That's not always appropriate. But you can know about God, and you can know that that light of God is shining there with the individual, that they are good, that they are spiritual. And this really brings our world together, and it brings us together maybe sometimes with people you'd, you'd never think that you would uh, get to know and enjoy. Well, each and every one of you are wonderful spiritual ideas. And each and every one of you are proceeding from this foundation of an all good, all powerful God. And your connection to that foundation is never going to be shaken or severed. If you think it is, think again. <laughs> because God is, is still caring for you. And we can prove the powerless of anything that's trying to shake or harm ourselves or our, our world on this solid foundation. Something we can, we can build on 
with every good thought, <laughs> we build this health and harmony. Well, thank you all for coming today, for being here, and it was totally my pleasure to share these ideas with you.